Well, welcome once again to Flawed Masterpieces. I'm so grateful to be here with uh, the woman I don't have to socially distance from, Timberly Eckelman. And uh, we're going to talk today about one of, it seems to me, one of the more fascinating persons when we think about flawed masterpieces. His flaws are incredibly clear. Uh, they are legal, uh, as a matter of fact. But also, he is essentially promised by Jesus that he is indeed a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. He's it's promised true. heaven itself. And so uh, we look at the thief on the cross, as he's sometimes called. And there's a couple of places where we find this. And I know, by the way, last week we started with Easter Day. Now we're going back a week uh, of sorts, uh, back a few days to Jesus' crucifixion. And that may be um, a little bit of a, a back-to-front situation. Maybe we should have started with this one. So you need to readjust your mind to before Easter, to the darkest day of Holy Week, what we call Good Friday. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, um, we're going to take this main passage in the Gospel of Luke. We'll look at the two others where he's mentioned. But right now, Luke chapter 23 We'll begin with the 32nd verse. Would you pray for us? Oh, and sure. then invite, um, sure. and then uh, read the scripture. Lord, all insight and all knowledge of scripture come from you. So we pray that you give that to us. The, the two of us who are teaching and the myriad of people who are listening, that you would open the scriptures to us and warm our hearts to your words. Convict us through your spirit and mm -hmm. enable us, empower us through your spirit, to live faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Two other men, in addition to Jesus, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Wow, what a passage. Uh, let me just begin by setting the stage because too often our Bible interpretation has been somewhat uh, ruined by the movies. When you think of these three crosses on the hill of Golgotha, we often think of three crosses way up in the air, far enough away from one another, that people could not possibly have conversations from one cross to the other. And that is movie magic, if you will, but it's not historical fact. Absolutely. Let me offer just a little bit, and it's, it's so easy when we talk about the crucifixion to spend time feeling sorry for Jesus for going through such physical torture. That's fine, because that, that certainly is true. But there's so much more going on, and the other things are so much more important. The first thing I want to let you know is that it's entirely possible that crosses were not way up in the air. They probably were really near ground level. Mm -hmm. And so the reason we know this is in this story, 
people come up to Jesus and speak to him. Mm -hmm. They don't speak to him as if he's way up in the air. That would have been essentially a lot more work for the same result. Roman soldiers were incredibly practical. Mm -hmm. They would have crucified the person with the, per the, the, the accused person's feet probably a foot off the ground. And so Jesus, as he hangs on the cross, because he's hanging down, is probably eye level with anyone who is there. And the other people who are uh, crucified also are at eye level. There's no reason to put them way up in the air, except it makes a really good photo mm -hmm. and video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what people were able to do, and this was part of the shame of crucifixion itself, is they were able to come and look right at the person's face. Rome wanted everyone to know, this is what happens to you if you go after Rome. And so the crucifixions that Rome did were primarily as public relations to say to people, don't you dare disobey the Roman Empire. And so therefore, we can imagine Jesus is at eye level. A couple other things, and these get pretty graphic. Number one, the idea that Jesus had a little bit of garment around the middle of his body, around the groin area, absolutely has no fact in history. The person was stripped naked. And as soon as crucifixion began, the body convulsed so much that the person would lose continence. So again, the, the image here, the, the, the picture here is someone who is so shameful and so ashamed by the process that they have, have lost continence right there their very most private elements of their life, their bodily functions, their sexual organs, are right there to be seen and made fun of and everything else. The last thing is, is that these three men could talk to each other even in whispers because they were that close. There's no sense that they were a far distance away. Again, Rome was far too practical. They would put them basically maybe a foot, maybe six inches apart from each other. The last thing, and it's hardly a point that, that matters, is that it probably wasn't in a cross-shaped cross, but it was in a T-shaped cross. There's all sorts of descriptions of that. And so as the person hung on the cross, what happened is their body would go like this. They would hang down. So when it says that there's a sign above Jesus' head, which other passages do, it's above his head because he is sagging down. So when he carries his cross, what he's carrying is not the whole cross as he goes from, one, from the center of Jerusalem out to the hill of Golgotha, but he's carrying the cross piece, the top of the T, and he carries that on his way to his own death. Thank you for just a few. I know just a few things, and maybe a little more than we need. But it's helpful to know because then we can get the picture of these people making fun of him, yep. and ultimately of this thief on the cross. Let me ask a question, Brian. Before we get to the the people who are being crucified, who was witnessing the crucifixion, according to this text? Well, first of all, because it says it's a crucifixion, because it's on the hill of Golgotha, it is at basically an entryway or a road. It is by a road mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. So anybody traveling in or out of Jerusalem from that particular gate would have seen this. Public square. It was a public square of sorts, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also we have uh, the women who are there. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, we have the Pharisees, and we have the soldiers, and we have the two thieves yeah. who are crucified. So the Pharisees are the people referred to in verse 35 as the rulers even sneered at him. Yes. So essentially at this point, people are absolutely belittling him. Um, the silent people are the followers, but everyone else from soldiers to the people, rulers of Israel, are sneering at him. And, and that was part of crucifixion, is right. that you 
you booed and hissed and and insulted the person mm -hmm. who was up mm -hmm. there because they were the worst of the worst. So having that sign above his head that said, this is the king of the Jews, was meant to taunt him. Pure See mockery. what we do to yeah. your king. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so who are these two people that were put up next to? You know, I'm going to ask you that because okay. uh, my my wife is incredibly smart and has looked at these passages as well. Yes. Um, who are these folks? You've done some research in the Greek, so well, lay it on it, us. Looking at the passage, we see, first of all, they're men, um, two other men. They're both criminals, and the word for criminal in this passage in Luke um, refers to someone who's an evildoer. So it was someone who had done something truly evil. It was not a, uh, a minor offense, in, but they were crucified for a major offense. Um, if you read in the Mark chapter 27 and Mark 15, uh, Luke, Matthew 27 and Mark 15 passages, the Greek word is slightly different. And that word, lestes, really refers to a robber or a highway robber. So the people that were crucified were people that preyed on the weakest. They were evil people. They deserved what they were being punished for. I like to think that perhaps one of the one of their crimes was the same kind of crime that was committed against the Good Samaritan mm -hmm. when he was set upon by robbers or lestas. Um, these are exactly the people that would lay in wait for travelers and would take advantage of the poorest and the weakest people. And we can probably assume that because they're being crucified rather than simply uh, executed mm -hmm. in a much more clean and will almost say humane way mm -hmm. that they have robbed Roman citizens. They're somewhat notorious. They're they're notorious and Rome wants to make an example of Absolutely. Them. Yeah. So these guys they're getting what they deserve. They they know they are. We see that later. <coughs> but they're not beyond joining in the insult. We see that in verse 39 or at least one of them um, one of the other passages that we read was it, um, I think it's Matthew, said that at the it's beginning, yeah. they were both um, taunting him. Let's read that if we could. Yeah, I want to sure. I want to bring Matthew that. Matthew 27. So let's go to Matthew 27. 38. And, uh, and here we go. Um, Matthew 27, 38 says this. Two rebels were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Last week, by the way, I made the point. I'm going to stop for a moment and say, last week I made the point that... Easter makes no sense. Dead people don't rise. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Jesus' crucifixion also makes no sense. It has no logical understanding. God himself is allowing himself to be crucified. That was something that made no sense. And so they were saying something that seems to be theologically and socially so accurate. If you have the ability to keep this from happening, of course you would save yourself. And uh, it is only the love of God for you and me mm -hmm. that means that Jesus does not save himself. It is the greatest tragedy, the greatest sure. mockery of justice the world has ever known. But God entered into it, planned for it very carefully and intentionally, as the writer of, uh, of Romans says, for the joy that was set before him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, therefore, the joy is you and me. Mm -hmm. and us mm -hmm. because that's the thing that's what and otherwise if you don't understand that it is God's love that keeps Jesus on the cross it's Jesus's love for you and me that keeps him on the cross the cross makes no sense absolutely and so um he saved others he can't save himself. And verse 44 says in the same way the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults in Matthew. on him yeah in Matthew and the rebels, both of them, 
The thing about this thief on the cross, as we call him, this criminal, um, is that he began by insulting Jesus himself, by mocking Jesus, by begging Jesus, save you yourself and save us too. He began by saying that, but then something happened. Yeah. And I think that's important because the reason I set the stage mm -hmm. for what the cross looks like and things like that for us is so that we might come to faith. Jesus did this in such a visual way mm -hmm. so that you and mm -hmm. I might come to faith. Mm -hmm. This robber, this insurrectionist, this rebel, this criminal, he saw what Jesus was doing when he was dying and something clicked inside him that turned him from someone who was arguing against Jesus, who was mocking Jesus himself to realize that this was some, the, the Son of God, the, the one who actually did not deserve this. Jesus, even in his dying, is ministering. Well, I think there was something else that happened before he realized who the Christ was, which was he realized his own sinfulness and deserving of death. Because when he rebukes yep. the, other, the other criminal, the first thing he says is, don't you fear God? We are under the same sentence. We are punished justly. Yeah. So we're going this back whole, to Luke. Yeah. Let's go back to Luke concept, 23, which is the, the, the rest of the story, right. if you will. Yeah. This whole concept of fearing God. He's on the cross, and he realizes he is one step away from judgment, and that he is under the same sentence, death sentence, yeah. that Jesus is under. And he knows that what they've been doing is blaspheming God and, and taunting God himself. How that was revealed to him, whether it was witnessing Jesus' response on the cross, whether he had previously heard Christ but had yet been and had not yielded to him, what happened in his heart at that moment, we don't know, but something happened. And the first thing that happened was him realizing he is the one that deserves death, not Jesus. And I think his, his realization of that is very similar to what we need in order to come to Christ is a realization in our own heart that the death that Christ suffered was something we deserved, not him. I have to tell a story about uh, seminary. It is exactly right. And, and uh, the year before Timberly arrived at seminary and turned my head literally <laughs> and figuratively in that moment, um, I remember sitting in the dining hall of uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and probably for three or four hours, something very, very long, um, a lot of us were sitting there, and we were asking the, the question, how much theology, how and how little theology do you need to gain heaven? How, how little do you need to know to be saved? We were spending all this time studying the Greek and the Hebrew and church history and theology and all the fine details of all these things to become pastors, but... The question we were asking at that moment was, how little do you need to know? Can a three-year-old come to faith in Christ? What's the, what's the mark in Scripture that says, this is as little as you need? And we kept coming back to this man, the thief on the cross. Yes. Because he is, first of all, he is horribly guilty. Mm -hmm. Second of all, he does not have a long life to live obediently. <laughs> Okay, we often think that being a Christian means living obediently for the rest of your life. That doesn't make you a Christian. It certainly displays Christ in you, and that's tremendously important. But it doesn't make you someone who is a follower of Jesus. And, and yet Jesus, the other thing we have here is this is one of the very few places where God promises heaven to the person, says, you will be and, in heaven and, with me. And you're jumping in ahead. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead, but yes, what you were saying a moment ago, what are the basic things that he says to come to this level of well, faith? And the first was the realization of his own sinfulness. Exactly. The second was he turned to Jesus and he asked Jesus to remember him, to remember him 
when he came into his kingdom. Okay, now you're what jumping does that ahead. Mean? <laughs> you're jumping ahead because oh, really? he actually says, yes, the first thing is conviction of sin. I'm convicted of my own sin. Right. He does that himself. And uh, uh, that's verse 41. Wrong. But right. this man has done nothing wrong. So a recognition oh, of yeah. Jesus' not, right. not deserving and essentially... I recognize my sinful humanity, mm -hmm. and I also recognize Jesus's sinless divinity. Absolutely. And with those two together, Absolutely. then I come to a question to Jesus right. to ask Jesus something. So that's so then the he comes to the because I've realized God's purity and my sinfulness. I can come to Jesus and ask Him to remember me when He comes into His kingdom. What did, we don't talk that way. Brian, remember me when you come into your... I mean, that's just not part of our conversation. What was he asking for? I, I'd love your opinion because I, I only have guesses here. But the one thing I'd say is that the word remember mm -hmm. has a much larger meaning in Scripture and in that day than any other place. You might remember, you might, you might know that, for instance, Jeremiah the prophet says that God remembers our sins no more. And so there's that idea that remembering is not just going, oh yeah, I met that person, mm -hmm. that person's name was mm -hmm. so-and-so, they had an interesting, mm -hmm. you know, mole on the side of their face. I, I don't know what it would be, but no, what they what it is, it's actually remembering the relationship and it is doing something about that. So it's an action as much as a mindfulness. It's, yeah. So when you come into your kingdom, remember me is a sense of take action on my behalf mm -hmm. when you come into your kingdom. This man is aligned himself with someone he expects to rule. Yes. Now, look at this Jesus. He's naked. He's on a cross. He's minutes from death. He's powerless before the Romans. And the other, the other person on the cross turns to him and says, hey, when you're king, don't forget about me. <laughs> I mean, that's it's an amazing incredible leap of faith. faith. That's yeah. a great point. It's, that's a great, great. it's an amazing faith. So this whole... And it's Boy, a leap of faith and, that I, almost everybody else was not. No, making. nobody. Yeah, they it's were all thinking, all. this is mm -hmm. over. We thought he was going to be the king. Yeah. He's done. This guy's like, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. I expect you to be the king. Yeah. I expect you to be the ruler of the universe. Please don't forget me. And and Jesus' response is amazing. He says, not only am I going to remember you, but today you will be with me in paradise. Well, and let me ask you, because I, you, you just raised a point I hadn't even thought of. Go for it. What was it about Jesus on the cross that gave yeah. him this perspective? What do you think? What do you because... I don't know, because I wasn't there. I, I, I think <laughs> the only a, thing I can point to... It's a very legal to, answer, dear, no, but come on. No, <laughs> the only thing I can point to is verse 34 of, this, of that verse where he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. The mere fact Jesus that this man, that, yeah. Jesus, uh, who is being crucified who's just been put on the cross, just been, uh, has already been beaten, has already been stripped, has already been abused. He's now on the cross, and he asks God as his father, he, he had claims that relationship, to ask God's forgiveness. That ability to forgive, even while you're suffering so extremely, yeah. and the understanding that you have the power to request that forgiveness from your father. That's in the face, unique. in the face of this ultimate ugliness and mocking of other people, I suspect that had a lot to do with changing his yeah. heart. Um, I think the work, the spirit, is beyond my understanding, but I suspect that his witness of Jesus's um, attitude toward those who were abusing him, and his understanding that this is bigger than being crucified for a crime. No. Yeah, <clears throat> and in the process, therefore, this man sees something that is not natural. It's Absolutely. not human. And that convicts me so much because as a follower of Christ, mm -hmm. I want people, and I know God wants people, to see me and see things that are not simply natural or 
human reaction. It's just natural to get angry in traffic. It's just natural to do this, to do that. And yet the point is when we do what is not natural, when we do what is truly spiritual, when we forgive when we don't have to, when we forgive when we really are being, being put upon, and when complete injustice is being done to us, that's the moment that Absolutely. people see Jesus in us. Absolutely. And I need to do better in that. Absolutely. So, yeah. The grace of forgiveness. Well, I wish I'd been at that table a year earlier um, when you were chatting with your friends, because I think, first of all, I would have liked to have known you were your mom. <laughs> but, um, no, I was a jerk until I knew you were. <laughs> I was straight out faster. I would have really enjoyed talking about this conversation because I would have come back to the passage in Ephesians, um, Ephesians 2, yeah, Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you are saved through mm -hmm. faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, but so that no one could boast. This man who Absolutely. says, who's Great now point. been told by God, I will be, you will be with me in paradise, didn't have time to get baptized. That's right. He didn't have time to join the church or tithe. He didn't learn he scripture. He didn't learn scripture. He couldn't recite the Ten Commandments. <coughs> exactly. He was lucky if he knew if there was a Ten Commandments. <coughs> he had no chance to reform his life. Yep. He had no chance to decide whether he was going to be a Baptist or a Presbyterian or Assembly of God or whatever. <coughs> All he did was say, remember me when you come to Paris. All he did was ask for Jesus to forgive him knowing that he could. And he was totally helpless. I mean, this is a guy that's, as, as, as I thought, incapacitated. He's helpless. He cannot do a thing for himself. And he recognizes that. And because he cannot do anything for himself, recognizing that, he is given the grace to ask for what he needs from the only one that can do it. And I think our biggest problem in this culture is, as human beings is we think we can do it for ourselves. Yep. Even Christians think, uh, you know, when someone dies, well, I'm sure they're in heaven because they were a good Christian, right. good, they were a good church goer. Uh, she, I mean, she did the flowers every week, whatever. Right. So what we're dealing with is, well, it's kind of an example, but I wish I'd been at, sitting at the table to talk with you guys about. <laughs> it's, it, you don't require a lot to be saved, but there are some things that are required. Yes, yes. Describe those things. Well, there's us, three things. Mm -hmm. There's three things. First of all, there's a recognition of our own sinfulness. Mm -hmm. The thief recognized that he deserved his punishment. Yes. Secondly, there's a recognition of God's holiness. He recognized that Christ did not deserve the punishment that he was getting. That he was holy. That he was without sin. And that he was the one that could save him. And then thirdly, he asked. He asked to be remembered. To be remembered by God. And... Um, he acknowledged, this is my Savior. Please remember me. And that's all he could do. Everything else was just, you know, he waited. He was helpless. He's on the cross. He died. Um, there's no service that he could render to God to save himself. And, and we so often want to serve and earn that salvation. So the sinful humanity that we have mm -hmm. the sinless divinity that only jesus has exactly and the salvation that only jesus can give mm -hmm. and asking for that and then humbly receiving it of course so this uh this person whose name we're not even given yeah exactly who's who's doesn't achieve anything for the kingdom except this example this person is held up to us really mm -hmm. it's the last conversation jesus says before he dies this person is truly a good example for our lessons today absolutely and he receives the last kindness jesus offers Mm -hmm. before he uh, dies mm -hmm. and goes to mm -hmm. the tomb. Mm -hmm. 
And we hope that that's an encouragement to you today. Um, this ends our Flawed Masterpiece uh, Bible study for today. Mm -hmm. Next week, remember, uh, as you're watching this online, we are also meeting in person at the church. We'd love to see you there. Uh, but if that's not a safe situation for you, for health reasons or other situations, then these videos will still remain a part of this time in Timberley. Thank you. This is the kind of dinner conversation we have all the time. Well, oh, not no. really. Not really. So usually the dog's at our feet, too. <laughs> but uh, we just hope you have uh, prospered from this. God bless you. We'll see you next week for another flawed masterpiece.